Good evening and welcome. Uh, I'm Pastor Tim Westermeyer, and on behalf of St. Philip the Deacon Lutheran Church in Plymouth, uh, it's my privilege and pleasure to welcome you tonight to the last installment of the 2019-2020 Faith and Life Lecture Series. I'm coming to you from the Sanctuary of St. Philip the Deacon, uh, which is where we hold these events. We're now in the 17th year, as I mentioned. Um, our speaker tonight is joining us remotely, and of course, we're coming to you virtually. Uh, if we were together live, I would actually at this point um, say a, a strong welcome, especially to folks who have never been to one of our events tonight. I hope there are many new faces who are tuning in to listen to this presentation tonight. And again, I want to say a, a strong welcome to each and every one of you. We are glad you are with us. Uh, the Faith and Life series, again, for 17 years now, has invited well-known, nationally, internationally recognized authors and speakers and business and nonprofit leaders, doctors and lawyers. We have had some uh, sports individuals join us, uh, not a lot, but a handful over the years. And tonight, we are delighted to be welcoming uh, a local boy who has done very well for himself. Um, he actually grew up in the backyard of where I'm broadcasting from tonight uh, in Medina. His family was connected and is, in fact, still connected to this congregation. Um, he went to YZ High School then went on to the University of Minnesota and then joined the NBA as an assistant coach, uh, first with the Washington Wizards and then, of course, with our own Minnesota Timberwolves. And about a year ago, he was named uh, the head coach of the Timberwolves, becoming, uh, through that appointment, the youngest head coach in the NBA. Uh, we are delighted to have him with us tonight. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to him in a second. He's gonna share a few thoughts uh, for 10 or 15 minutes. After he's done, I'm gonna come back and we're gonna have some opportunities for questions with him. Uh, we have the capability, I believe, uh, through our streaming system for you to send us questions. We'll try to get to as many of those as we can. So please uh, send your questions in and uh, we'll be getting to those after his presentation. Again, welcome to each and every one of you. And now I am delighted to turn it over to Coach Ryan Saunders. Thanks, Pastor Westmeyer. Um, you know, first off, I'll say, you know, it's an honor to be here, um, you know, in front of all, all of you. And uh, this isn't a platform that I take lightly. You know, I've uh, been given an opportunity to share a little bit about my faith journey and what a relationship uh, with Christ has done for me and, and, and in my life. Um, you know, I, I'll start tonight off the same way I started a, I did a um, webinar last week for um, the NABC, a um, bunch of youth, uh, high school, college, uh, some professional international coaches, um, ended up being close to 15,000 coaches tuning in uh, as a, you know, we're all finding a new normal, um, you know, doing things off Zoom, off webinars and, and just trying to, you know, continue on with our lives uh, virtually. Uh, but I said to start that that uh, webinar that I don't have all the answers um, when it comes to coaching, um, but you know I, I, I do my best and I have um, a way of doing things that I feel is one that um, has has worked for me, one that I believe in, um, and I'll tell you, you all the same thing, uh, uh, but a little different message tonight. You know I I want to make it a point. Um, you know that I'm far from the perfect Christian. Um, I have plenty of flaws. Um, as we all do. Uh, but I come here tonight humbly and, you know, with a knowing um, that the Bible is true. And, um, you know, that's, that's, that's a main message for me that, you know, church has always been um, part of my family's life and my life. Um, but as time went on, and, you know, I'm, I just turned 34 a couple weeks ago here. Um, but as time went on, my relationship with Christ uh, grew. And, you know, as we all know, any relationship, um, takes effort, uh, takes commitment, um, you know, and, and it, it goes through its, its ups and downs, um, you know, and, and that's a message that I want to share with, with whoever's listening tonight, fellow Christians, but also individuals that might be seeking a path um, and a path that uh, maybe they, they haven't gone down often. So, you know, however you got here tonight on this, this uh, live stream, um, you know, we're, we're all obviously all glad you're here because uh, you know, you never know what something can do for you, uh, in, in a, in a moment of, you know, however you might've got here. So, you know, I, um, Proverbs, uh, three, five is a verse I've constantly had to remind myself, um, of, and, uh, you know, trust in the Lord with all your heart, 
uh, and lean on your own, your own, own understanding. And, uh, you know, I, I think I, I speak for, you know, a lot of Christians, but, you know, just people in general is that that's, 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 that's tough at times. Um, because you, you get on with your, your daily, your, your earthly lives. And, um, you know, it's tough to come back to that, but, you know, as I said earlier, you know, relationships can see ups and downs. Um, it took me a while, but I learned that faith, uh, faith does not have to be linear and, uh, that you can give yourself grace and cause God wants you to give yourself grace. And over time, you know, I'm still working on that, but over time I've, uh, I've been able to do more of that, you know, give myself grace. Uh, you know, I'll say, you know, it's, it's pretty well known. I mean, especially for members of St. Philip the Deacon, uh, who have, uh, had the chance to, to know my dad, but, you know, I got to experience the highs and lows of faith, um, during the summer of 2015. And, uh, you know, that was a summer where my life changed. And as my father, um, entered a state where he was fighting for his life, um, you know, one that ultimately ended, um, in October of that year, uh, you know, four years later, I can look back and, and, and reflect and say, um, and see how my faith had to go through a time of questioning, you know, a question of, of why, you know, why would something like this happen? Um, you know, there, I, I remember, and I'm not ashamed to say it right now. Um, I remember there were times where I, I, you know, would ask, you know, out loud, you know, where are you, God? Um, you know, and, and, but that really strengthened me and that strengthened my relationship with Christ. Um, you know, during that time, we were a family that we didn't lose faith. You know, we might have had those those moments of, of I guess, weakness or, or vulnerability. Um, but all the way up until his last breath, you know, we uh, we didn't lose faith that that something great was could happen. A miracle could happen. Um, and, and I'll talk about it. But I, I think about after um, after he passed away, you know, there's been a lot of miracles in my life, um, you know, with the help of community and friends. You know, we grieved and we grieved in a way, um, you know, uh, that was public at times, uh, you know, difficult, obviously watching, um, you know, powerful, but difficult, uh, you know, watching a, um, in front of 20,000 people, um, you know, 10 minutes of, of your videos of your dad, you know, a week after he passed away while you're standing, you know, out on the court before the national anthem when I was an assistant with the Timberwolves. You know, that was hard because um, I was used to him being right next to me during that time. And a lot of people don't know that. Um, but, you know, we grieved, but, but our faith became stronger through that. Um, you know, I, when going through tough times, you know, like, like now, um, you know, we, it, obviously everybody's going through something right now. Um, you know, could be questioning, um, could be financially. Um, everybody has a battle they're, they're facing at the moment. Um, but, you know, just I'd say in the past four years, um, when my mother, you know, when going through tough times, there were moments that my mother and I would talk, uh, you know, either her tough times or my tough times. And one of us always seemed to, to bring up, you know, the, something along the lines of, you know, I wish I had the strength I had after dad passed. And, you know, I, I think at first, you know, I think she said it the first time, um, but like it, it really stuck with me because I felt that too. You know, in, in, in tough times, you know, times that that was the toughest time of my life, you know, during during that um, going through that. But in, in tough times after that, you know, something that may not seem as big a deal, but still is something that you're going through at that moment. Um, you kind of realize that, you know, that wasn't necessarily strength, you know, right after he passed. That was a, a, a complete um, willingness uh, to let God got in. Uh, because we were in a, you know, complete vulnerable state. Um, we, we were down to what we felt was we didn't know how life was going to continue on. Um, but, you know, we were open and, you know, we knew that God had to, had to become stronger in our lives and, and our relationships had to grow, you know, which, uh, which leads me to a thought and, and someone said something along the lines of it, but, um, you know, I, I've used this before and, you know, I've always gone, gone back and forth when doing coaches clinics and, and webinars on, on um, basketball. You know, do I bring up my faith? Because it is such a big part of my life. Uh, and and it, it, you go back and forth because, you know, hey, we need, to, we need to spread the gospel. 
Um, you never know who it can touch, but you also, you know, you want to be respectful of, of others too, who don't want it, you know, I guess in a way, you know, shoved down their throats when they just come to watch how I design a post-up play or a baseline out of bounds play. Um, but, uh, you know, you, uh, I have gotten to the point where I'm very comfortable always stating something on my faith during, during those moments. And the thing that I've, I've used a lot is, you know, I always say, you know, don't let adversity be the only time you fall to your knees. And I, I thought, of, you know, I, I kind of have developed more of a mindset with that where, you know, we need to praise God during the good times too. Um, that's what having a relationship is, you know, celebrating the good, uh, but relying on love, relying on trust and, and patience um, during the tough times, you know, and, and I'll say, you know, I talk about miracles, miracles and grace, because um, I feel like I'm, I'm a product of a number of those. I've been afforded a number of great opportunities and, and I'm very thankful of that. Um, but God has offered me so much grace since my father passed. Um, I'm very love my life. Um, who's probably listening in the other room, uh, Haley. So, uh, I had a son, actually, he turns a year old in, in uh, a month here. Um, turns a year old. He bears my father's, uh, my father's name, Philip as his middle name. So Lucas Philip. Um, and then, you know, I've been fortunate to have the opportunity to become a head coach in the NBA at 32 years old. Um, you know, it's, it's special to, to look at a point of where your life kind of was and know that know that you were down to, you know, you wouldn't say nothing, but, you know, emotionally you almost felt you were down to nothing, but the only, and the only thing that could pull you out of there, out of that um, space was God. And the only thing that could help you through that was faith and, you know, other, other members of the faith community, because, you know, fellowship, fellowship is huge. Um, I, I actually had a chance to lead a, um, I'm in a, a, a group of other executives in the NBA, coaches, um, some agents around the NBA, um, you know, from other teams. It's probably up to about 20, 25 uh, men now. And we call ourselves brothers in Christ. And every mo every Tuesday morning at 6 a.m., uh, we get on a, a conference call and we have a rotating, you know, somebody leads that that call. But we have a rotating uh, schedule where, where you share a message. And, you know, I actually had the privilege of, of sharing my, a message this last week. And, um, you know, that was the message that I wanted to speak on was, you know, how, how important fellowship is. And just because we, we may not be able to experience fellowship physically right now, you know, being around fellow Christians and having that in your life um, just, just strengths, strengthens you. And, and it, it takes you to a different place. Um, so, I mean, that would be, be a, a source of encouragement that I, I would share if, you know, if you need, you know, faithful people around you, you know, they're, they're out there, they're out there. And, and those relationships are, are deeper and, and they mean something, um, you know, but like I said, you know, I've been afforded a lot of grace in my life. Um, and it wasn't until I really let the grace in that I was able to experience all of it. Um, you know, I, I talk about being a coach, um, you know, as my profession, um, you know, in this profession, as a professional basketball coach, um, you're a leader of men. Uh, so the platform is great, but the, uh, the responsibility is greater. And, you know, my goal as a coach is, uh, you know, simply put, I want to coach the person before I coach the athlete. And I think that's important because, you know, even though not everyone that I coach or, or, or might work with will believe in what I believe in, you know, when it comes to Jesus Christ, um, the same principles I think that I try to live by as a Christian. Um, and I say try because, you know, once again, we all fall short. Uh, but I, I try to live by as a Christian. Um, I build my foundation on when it, when it comes to coaching. And, you know, this is a big reason why, you know, I'm sure that if any media members or people who watch my press conferences, they'd be, um, they, they'd say that, that they've heard this over a hundred, over a hundred times, but I talk a lot about process over outcome. And it's because I believe it. Uh, you know, if our process, if, if our process to get better as a, as a basketball team um, and to get in a position where we have an opportunity to win is right, um, and we feel good about that, you know, I can live with the outcome. Now, now it might not be, 
I might not enjoy it. And it might take me a little bit of time to get to a place where I can live with that outcome. Um, you know, I, Hey, there's plenty of nights where I come home and my wife, see, I'm down in the office. I don't get a whole lot of sleep because, you know, you're thinking about the game, but you know, eventually you get to a place where, where you can, you can move forward because, um, you have to move forward. We got to fail quickly. You know, games come quick for us in, in the NBA. We play at least 82 a year. Um, you know, and obviously we're hoping we can get to something close to that, you know, but nobody knows. Oh, oh my God. Um, you know, but that's something I talk about a lot. And I think the same thing goes for, for um, our faith, you know, just trying to be better than we were the day before. And, you know, there's plenty of days where I'm, um, I'd say I'd stay pretty, you know, even, you know, there's plenty of days I take steps back. Um, but I'd like to think that there's more days I take steps forward than, than days that I take steps back. And I, I think that's important. And, and that goes back to my, my message of giving yourself grace. Um, you know, I, I know some people will, will tuned in to hear a little bit of basketball and I'm sure I'll have some questions, but, um, you know, for our team, we're going through a time when we're, we're the youngest team in the NBA. Um, which means there are plenty of growing pains, but uh, there's also a lot of room to grow. And, and you know, sharing a common bond of faith with our president, uh, Gerson Rosas, has allowed me to coach with conviction and coach with a, with a knowing that we're building and growing in a way where we can have high goals for our group on the court, but we can also have high, high goals for our group off the court, which I think is something that's pretty special. Because like I said, it, it's a... You know, the, the platform is great, but the responsibility is greater. Um, and that's just being being rooted in our faith. That's our That was our common connection, myself and, and Gerson, who he and I actually are both members of that Brothers in Christ call. And we've done that for the last four years. And now, you know, we're we're working together as partners. So, I mean, faith, faith puts you with people. Um, it, it puts you with people. Uh, you know, God, God does that in a way that, that can do great things in, in your life. Um, you know, last thing I kind of want to touch on before we open it up, you know, to the group and Pastor Westmeyer, um, once again, I appreciate you letting me share, share this message. Cause, um, that's one of the things that, that I guess quarantine and doing this right now has, has allowed me to do a little bit more of, but, um, you know, I think anybody who, you know, Pastor Westmeyer, you, you went, you went over what, you know, my background is in Minnesota, you know, grew up, out in the Wyzetta area, went to the University of Minnesota, um, ended up spending five years in Washington, D.C., um, but then ended up, you know, coming back to Minnesota. And now I'm able to live out a childhood dream of um, working to build a contender uh, with, the t one, the team my dad coached, but a team that I love in a state that I love and, you know, with people that I love. So it's really special to me. But, um, you know, people ask a lot, ask me a lot, and they ask me to talk about legacy. And, uh, you know, legacy is a word that's used um, a lot when, when people mention me and the Timberwolves. And, you know, but it, it's something that I kind of stay away from because, you know, I've, I've never really shared this portion of it right yet. But, you know, it's because people's vision of legacy in regards to me is different than what my vision of legacy is for, for myself. And I say that because my dad never told me that basketball had to be a part of my life. Um, you know, I chose to make that a part of my life, but my father, you know, and mother, um, did let it be known that being, being a good man, um, and a, and a Christian man was my path. And that was to be part of my life. You know, so my legacy isn't necessarily to follow in my father's footsteps and, and be a great basketball coach, you know, which is something that, you know, I'm working every day to be, you know, I feel very good about where I am, but obviously I, I, I want to grow. I want to be better. Uh, I think we always need, need to be trying to be better, but um, my legacy is to be my own man. And, you know, he'd tell me that. And I think I said that in my opening press conference, um, you know, he'd, he'd tell me to work to be a better man than I was the day before, um, especially while I have a platform where, you know, people will want to listen to me. And, you know, I think it's, it, you know, it's, it's fortunate. I'm fortunate that, you know, my job title, um, my job title gives me opportunities like this. Uh, during this quarantine, we've, um, as a team, because uh, we have a number of believers in, in our organization or, or within our, our players, um, you know, our roster, you know, we have a chapel 
uh, every night, every every Saturday evening um, at eight o'clock uh, for our organization. Anybody can join, but there's no pressure to join. Um, it's just there if, there if you want to. Um, but it's led by our chaplain Matt Moberg, and he opens every message um, with with, with a, a, a saying um, that's really powerful. And, and I don't want to screw it up because I'm sure Matt's watching. Um, and we hear it. We he's our chaplain, so we hear it before every game too. But um, it says, "We gather to remind uh, one another um, and remember uh, and remember for ourselves that we are." who we are is more important than what we do. Um, even if what we do gets more attention than who we are. And, you know, as I talk about my path and I look forward to what I would hope people would tell my son, Lucas, you know, about his father and and the legacy that he's a part of, um, you know, I hope they'd say that he was someone that wasn't defined, um, by what he did, but rather he was defined by how he lived and and how he tried to live um, for Christ. Uh, so, I mean, that's, that's my message of faith. Um, it's one that, you know, I, I humbly say I'm, I'm no one really special, just, uh, just somebody who, you know, has tried to do things, um, you know, the right way, uh, and, and do things in a way that, um, you know, God would be proud of. But once again, I, I just offer up, offer up to everybody listening that, um, especially right now as a society, giving ourselves grace, um, is important. And I learned to do that. And, and that's where my relationship, uh, with the Lord, uh, strengthened. So with that being said, I'll open it up to you, to you, Pastor Westermeyer. All right. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you again, uh, coach Saunders. Um, I'm going to let you rest your voice for just a second. <laughs> <laughs> this would be the point in the evening and it's going to be the point in this evening when I want to say a few words of thanks, um, these events are, uh, they're a community service of St. Philip Deacon, but they are funded entirely by uh, generous gifts and contributions from individuals and uh, corporations. And actually you can, we, we don't have a print uh, program to hand to you tonight, but we do have a uh, one that you can look at online on the Faith and Life site. And I just wanna say, especially as we're coming to the end of this season, uh, a deep word of thanks to all of our sponsors, to everyone who makes these events possible. And I'm going to name a few of them, uh, if you'll bear with me quickly. Thrivent Financial, uh, Jim, thank you for your uh, faithful uh, partnership. Ulrich Real Estate Group, Beth and Eddie, thanks to you. Uh, Mally Design, Brian and Danae, I'm grateful to both of you. Honeybee Capital, Catherine. Uh, Mode of Action, uh, thank you for your support. Uh, Rapid Packaging, Phil and Mona. Uh, Productivity, Greg and Lisa. Cressa, Jim and Ruth Ann. Um, I also want to thank um, Paul and Michelle Cook, uh, Paul and Patrick Kane, uh, Tim and Janice Maudlin, uh, Jay and Jennifer Novak, Ron and Janet Schutz. Um, and I and we've got everyone else printed in, in, in a thing you can look at online. Um, I also want to mention a special word of thanks to Coach Saunders. Uh, again, I mentioned we bring speakers from around the country and indeed from around the world. And uh, part of the expense we have is bringing them here and and, uh, paying them an honorarium. He has very graciously tonight um, declined an honorarium. So in lieu of that, uh, we're delighted as a series uh, to be able to provide some face shields uh, to frontline medical workers around the country. And uh, we've made an investment in that, but uh, Jeff and Patrice of Mastercraft Mastercraft labels are also helping to make that possible. So, um, Coach Saunders, again, thanks for your generosity and helping to make that possible. And again, I want to say a, a strong word of thanks to everyone else who makes these events possible. Um, I also want to give a shout out. We've got Paul on the audio board and Darren and Kate in the sound room. Um, one of the new normal things is that we rely so much on technology, and at about 6 35, we weren't sure this was going to work. So, I hope it is working. Um, and let's see, Jeff Elstad uh, is our musician. Jeff uh, is not with us tonight, uh, but uh, Jeff, thank you as always for your uh, partnership. And I also want to mention uh, a quarterly magazine that the church puts out. I'm mentioning this one specifically, and Ryan, I don't know if you've seen this, but this is the one that has the interview with you. So you can find this online if you want to uh, read an interview with Coach Saunders uh, at spdlc.org slash inspire. Okay, and again, I hope I haven't forgotten anyone I was supposed to thank. Um, We're so grateful to all of you. I 
was worried initially that I wasn't going to have enough questions for you, Coach Saunders. And now um, my, my hunch is we probably won't get to all of them. So, so I didn't talk long enough. No, no, you're fine. We're going to, this will give us a chance to get to more of them. All right. <laughs> and uh, if you did submit a question, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if we don't get to yours, uh, I apologize in advance. I'm going to start though, uh, coach Saunders, you, you closed by talking a little bit about, um, it opened and closed by talking about the importance yeah. of grace and, and giving yeah. ourselves grace. So one of the questions that's come in already tonight is, uh, when it comes to opening up grace, what's your best suggestion or what do you mm -hmm. do in order to accomplish that for yourself? Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's, it's been an ongoing, you know, it's been an ongoing process for me and, you know, I'm, I'm always open to, to better ways of doing things, but I think it's, um, it's, it's really been just talking to loved ones, you know, and talking through things and not, not letting things, you know, I guess fester you know, deep inside you, but also, um, the power of prayer mm. and, uh, you know, just taking that time, um, having a, you know, having, gr giving yourself grace can mean a number of things. Um, for me, uh, you know, when I get back centered with the Lord, um, you know, whether it be my devotion in the morning, whether it be, you know, watching a sermon, whether it be, you know, listening to a message, um, you know, getting in the Bible, whatever it is, um, that helps me give myself grace. Um, because, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, you know, I, and I'm, I'm, you know, fully, I fully acknowledge that my job is in the end is results based. And I understand that, um, you know, but you know, I, I'd rep my ultimate victory and all of our ultimate victories as Christians, you know, is there for us in the end after this life. Um, so I think once I've been able to kind of think a little more, along those lines, I've been able to give myself a little bit more grace, but it's, it's still tough. I still have a lot of tough days, you know, as there's ups and downs, um, you know, in sports. Good. All right. Thank you. Um, this was, uh, and I'm not gonna, in, I don't think I'm going to actually say who these are from and this one, I'm particularly not going to, but I really, uh, I, I want to say a thank you to this, uh, Questioner, this is from a 14 year old. And this whole series, of course, is called Faith and Life. It's about yeah. how faith is part of every dimension of, of life. So I'm going to read uh, part of what he wrote. Um, he says, I'm a 14 year old eighth grader, and I find it hard to be open about my faith. When I do, I seem to get made fun of for believing in fairy tales or told that I should believe in science instead of a phony God. Mm -hmm. It is so frustrating. Uh, I don't have hatred for the people that say these things, but I don't understand why they have such a problem with what I believe. I just pray that God can show them love instead of hate. Uh, Coach yeah. Saunders, have you ever been made fun of because of your faith? What is faith like in the NBA? Um, and he says, he concludes by saying, I got to the point where I wouldn't say a word around people who are bad-mouthing Christian beliefs as they would all turn on me. Yeah. So yeah. what would you say to him, to this young 14-year-old? Oh, I'd, I'd tell, first off, I'd tell him, I give him a lot of credit, um, a lot of credit, not, not only for taking time to, to watch, um, you know, something like this, you know, that revolves around faith, but also, you know, being open with your faith, uh, because, you know, Hey, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, whatever, whoever, whoever wrote that in, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't rooted in my faith or probably strong enough in my faith at 14 years old to, um, be able to speak openly or outwardly about it. Um, so I give you a ton of credit, but I, I tell you that, um, you know, just continue on with the, with the thought process of that the Bible is true. Um, the Bible's true. I mean, it, it, there's no other way to put it. And, you know, people, you know, I, I hope, I hope those aren't necessarily your friends that, that maybe make fun of you for that. But if, if, if they are, you know, pray for your friends, pray for them that, that they'll be able to have, um, the opportunity to, to, to be as open with their faith and be as, um, strong in their faith as you are. Um, so I just, I give you a lot of credit, uh, you know, whoever wrote that in, that's really cool. And again, I want to give credit to this young man as well. And everyone's tuning in to coach Saunders to see you, not me, but he does meet men. Man, you're, you're going to make me emotional tonight now. Gosh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. That's, that's um, one of the coolest things I've heard. Well, uh, he, he mentions in that question, um, he, she's told he should believe in science instead of faith. And that's a little bit of a hobby horse for me. And I've actually taught a couple 
multi-week classes about the supposed conflict between science faith and faith. That's a long story, but there, I would say there is not a conflict, and uh, no. it, it's a. It makes me convicted that I, we need to do more teaching about that because it's just mm -hmm. a misunderstanding. Um, all right, let's see. We'll continue with this sort of faith, and we will have some basketball questions. And by the way, thanks to everyone who knows way more about basketball than I do for sending in questions. Uh, so we will have some more technical basketball questions. This one still, this is sort of a hybrid. Do you have any role models of faith in the NBA who either have in the past encouraged you um, or encourage you in, at present? So any role, mo uh, role models of faith in the NBA? Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, you know, I guess... Role model wise, you know, all of all of the in, individuals that that I you know get get together with, I guess virtually every Tuesday morning, and we you know since we're all in different different cities, um, we we've done it virtually for the last you know five years. So so this is nothing new for us. But um, you know, a lot of those guys are older than me, uh, so they've been great role models and great. Um, they've been great for me as I've you know navigated being a new father too. And, and trying to lead a household in, in a, in a um, Christian way. Uh, now, once again, it's not always perfect, but, you know, those are our intentions. Those are my intentions. Um, and then the NBA, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of athletes that are um, strong in their faith that a lot of people wouldn't know about. And, you know, we, I, I mentioned a little bit about our chapel uh, before every game. And, you know, no matter what, what city, um, you're in, there will be a chapel one hour uh, prior to tip off. And that's for, you know, players, coaches, executives from both teams. Mm -hmm. So it's not just our team that's in there. It, you know, we're in there with, with other um, opponents and you think about it, you know, we, these are a lot of times, these are guys who make a lot, a lot of money to, you know, outperform the guy that they're holding their hand praying with, you know, and, and an hour from now, which is pretty powerful to think about that. And there's been a number of, of guys that, that I did not know were, were Christians that show up to that chapel. Um, you know, a, a lot of superstars that you might not, that you see on TV, you see in commercials, you might not know, you know, that because they haven't been as open with their faith. Um, but, you know, being able to, you know, know that you have a common uh, bond with those guys, uh, even when competing against them. And I say that for myself, too, as a coach, competing against them. Um, it's pretty special and, you know, it always makes it where, you know, if you ever see them, you know, there's been times where I've seen some of those guys, you know, out to eat when we've been about to play uh, an opponent the night before, you know, if, I'm, if I go to a restaurant and they might be at the same restaurant, you know, they'll always wave hello. I always wave hello to them. Cause I know that, you know, even though we've only said five words to each other, that we both share a common um, love. And that's, that's uh that's a love for, for the Lord. Nice. Um, there, there's a sort of a couple questions here that are, one's a follow-up uh, to the other, but it's, I'll start with first basketball's on hold, but fans are getting their fix watching the last dance featuring Michael Jordan in his last season mm -hmm. with the bulls. Um, it's the most viewed ESPN documentary. Uh, so the question is, are you watching or, and are there any lessons or reflections yeah. from this documentary? That's the first one. And I'll let yeah. you answer and I'll follow it up. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely watching because, uh, because it was, um, uh, Michael Jordan was my era. I mean, I, I was my first ever, uh, professional basketball game was going to the old Chicago stadium with my family, um, and, and seeing a game. Uh, you know, I, I also, I remember back my mom, I wanted a pair of, of Michael uh, of Chicago bull shorts so badly when I was growing up. And, uh, and, you know, my dad was, he was a, a CBA, a minor league coach at the time. Um, you know, I, I believe he was in lacrosse and I know I wanted these, you know, these Chicago bull shorts so badly, you know, we had four kids, young family. And, um, you know, I, I didn't get them for a little while there. And then one, one day, um, I came home and my mom, and I guess it shows you my mom's heart too. Um, my mom, uh, cut off a pair of red sweatpants and she used a Sharpie and paint to make me a pair of bull shorts. Mm. And now looking back on it, I, I wish I still had those, but uh, that was just something special. And, and that's kind of what the last dance has brought me back to was, was a nostalgia and a childhood, um, you know, a, a childhood, uh, you know, memory and, and um, of watching the bulls teams. 
And I think there's a lot of things, you know, I go back and forth between watching it, watching the last dance as a fan and watching it as a coach that can take a number of lessons from, you know, that whole documentary, you know, lessons in dysfunction, lessons in um, resilience, lessons in, you know, dealing with players, you know, knowing that everybody's a little bit differently, different. Um, you know, there, there's, there's a, been a lot of thoughts I've had, but, um, you know, I've, I've drawn a lot from it. And actually our organization, we, uh, every, every Friday at three o'clock, um, we get on, on a zoom call for an hour and we discuss the last dance, um, mm. you know, just to, you know, and, and once again, it's open, but just seeing what, you know, things worked for those, um, those guys at that time. And then what things maybe didn't and what we could draw from that. So I'm, I'm a fan, but I'm also trying to learn too. Good. Um, all right. I think you've got, you've, you answered the follow-up to that. So I'll, I'll move on that. Um, here's a question about the current season with the season on hold. Do you think it's possible for the NBA season to resume? And if so, what do you think the format might look like? Uh, hey, I think, I think everybody, everybody else's um, guess would be as good as mine, you know, right now we're, you know, obviously, you know, what we're going through right now with this pandemic is, um, the first thought is safety and, uh, safety, not just for, you know, those who work at the NBA, but, but the world and navigating through this in a way where, you know, people can come out the other side and, and hopefully not have too much collateral damage, whatever that looks like. Um, you know, unfortunately we, it's touched us, uh, as an organization where, um, Carl Towns lost his mother and, um, and, you know, that's, that's rock, rocked us in a way because we love Carl. And, you know, in this moment, we, we're not able to put our arms around Carl um, because we are, you know, keeping our distance. Um, so, you know, safety is number one priority. Whenever it's safe, um, you know, I'm sure they're, they're exhausting all possible ways of, of doing this. Uh, but, you know, I feel very, very fortunate to be in a league where we have a commissioner like Commissioner Silver who, um, who doesn't just think of, you know, what this, you know, what this means for sport, but he thinks of what it means for society. And, you know, that can go as far as, you know, not wanting to take tests away from, you know, under, uh, under, uh, you know, utilized, um, you know, society under, um, you know, communities that might not be, be able to underprivileged com communities that might not be able to, you know, get those tests, you know, he's, he's doing everything the right way and keeping our, our safety, um, you know, as a top priority. Um, so we'll, we'll let's take a couple more have just come in about the current uh, pandemic situation. Uh, how have you been able to keep a sense of unity in your team mm -hmm. during this time? And has faith played a role in that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, we have a sense of unity in a way that, you know, we, we work in small groups a lot of times, um, especially as we have some players in other markets, uh, you know, maybe on the West coast or on the East coast. So timing wise, you know, we do a number of zoom calls. Um, we've done a number of projects. Um, you know, I try to FaceTime the players, you know, once kind of every 10 days. Um, but then a number more texts, a number more phone calls with that. But, you know, you want to make sure that they're able to focus on their families, uh, too, right now, because that's, you know, the mo most important thing, but you also, you know, want to make sure that they, uh, they come back with a mindset of, you know, through this whole pandemic, you know, not working to get ready when the time comes, but staying ready. And that means a number of different things. Um, but faith plays a role for a, a number of guys. And that's a common connection for um, a number of players and myself on this team. Um, so, you know, I always enjoy those FaceTimes and those conversations where we could dive a little deeper in that and seeing those guys. And a lot of times they're significant others. Um, on that chapel call at 8 p.m. on Saturdays. You know, that's my wife and my, uh, one of our, our, our best times of the week over these last probably nine weeks is, is hopping on that chapel call and seeing, having fellowship with other mm -hmm. believers. Uh, this person says, I'm scared about people who don't seem to take the pandemic seriously. What's your biggest fear? And then says, mm -hmm. keep the faith coach, all the best. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think we all have a, have a sense of, of fear in that way. Um, you know, and, and it goes kind of ties into what I talked about is, you know, we want to have faith over fear, but sometimes it's 
that's difficult. And I think right now is, is one of those times, um, you know, ha- having faith over fear, you know, all the time, it sounds great and it sounds perfect. Um, but unfortunately we live in a, an imperfect imper- world. Uh, so, you know, for myself, I mean, I think it's, it's trusting that, um, that we're going to do as a family and, you know, we're going to do everything we can to, to help be a part of the solution. And that's, that can be as simple as, um, you know, wearing a face mask when out in public, uh, you know, or uh, all the way into kind of just quarantining in your house, uh, but following guidelines, following rules, um, but also having an understanding that um, everybody's going through something different, different right now. All right. So moving, um, and again, I want to thank everyone who keeps sending questions in. Um, moving from the heavy topic of uh, COVID to a lighter one, and we, we chatted a little before the call, and you said we hope you hope we could have a little fun too. So this this person wrote in and said, "What's the funniest thing that ever happened to you in the NBA? Do players play jokes on you, and do you play jokes on them?" Ooh, that's a that's a good. Uh... That's a good question. Um, yeah, <laughs> Maybe I mean, you can't we, share those. I don't no, know. <laughs> no, I can, I, I can share it. I can share it. Uh, no, we, you know, we, we work in professional sports. And I said, I said that ultimately at the end of the day, everybody looks at, looks at the record. Um, but a lot of times people don't look at what's being built too. And, you know, I, I, I will say that, you know, I've had an opportunity to go back and watch our games um, you know, from earlier this season, you know, look at things that worked, the things that didn't work. I feel really good about where this team is going. Um, you know, for, you know, cause we established, you know, how we want to play. Um, but I also, I feel even better how this team is going after being able to experience, look back and th- think about some of the memories that have already been made this year. And that's, you know, top to bottom with, within our organization, you know, we have so many great people and, you know, you do want to have fun with, you know, as you, as you're working in a high pressure job, you want to have fun with it too. So there's been plenty, there's been plenty of times, uh, that jokes have been played or, you know, but it's gotta be in the right time. Um, you know, I'll use one. There's a, there's a, we have a, a guy on our staff and he's our kind of quality control, you know, I guess kind of chief of staff in a way where he just kind of keeps things kind of moving, keeps things, uh, keeps things, uh, flowing throughout the day and through practice, making sure we're organized and people are in the right place. And, um, this earlier this year, Carl threw a Halloween party downtown and, uh, I guess the players got to him and, you know, that's the only reason he knows that he, 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 he wouldn't have been able to do this if if the players didn't tell me that they put him up to this, but he got, the players got to him and he came to the Halloween party dressed as me with a whistle you know, wearing what I wear all the time. And I always, I have all these little cards that I like to, and they're different colors. They're color coordinated. So if you see me pulling cards out of my suit pocket during the game, I have one for, you know, after timeout plays, one for the fourth quarter, uh, one for plays that I want to run to start quarters, a bunch of different things and uh, substitutions, a bunch of different things. And they gave him a stack of about 50 cards and he was running around the Halloween party blowing the whistle and yelling because I want our team to play fast. And so I'm always yelling pace, pace, pace. So he was yelling pace this whole time. So players put him up to that. I thought that was a pretty good one. <laughs> okay. I got him back the next day. How did you get him back? In practice. Oh, I see. <laughs> we, we had, we had a lot of pace to practice. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know. This is really interesting. Before the season was suspended this year, which team was the most difficult to prepare your team to play against and why? And what about which individual player? Yeah. Um, they're all difficult, you know, really. And, and that's not, you know, I'm not just saying that, you know, they're all difficult and all players, players are difficult to prepare for. You know, I wouldn't put one above the other. I mean, you have, you know, I'm sure everybody can guess, you know, the list if you follow a little bit of sport sports, but you know, um, it's, uh, you have to trust your process in preparation, trust that you're going to be able to put, um, try to put guys in the best position to succeed. Um, but also know that sometimes, you know, these players are really, really good and, you know, Hey, there's, there's no bad players in the NBA, just, just some teams that maybe aren't as good as others. Mm. So, you know, anybody can have, have a night. Uh, so every night's a tough night. All right. Fair enough. Um, 
this one says when you played basketball, and this is going back a few years, um, when you were in high school, when you played basketball in high school, you played for a program called a Minnesota magic. I assume yeah. that's correct. Uh, that program was run by a gentleman named Matt Ricker who coached you, who's now retired. What would you say to Matt now, if you could, and how did that program help you to get uh, where you are now? Um, I'd say, you know, the Minnesota magic are, you know, they're, a, um, they're a group that, that was, uh, I was able to form a lot of friend, a lot of friendships, a lot of bonds with. Um, so obviously, I'm I'm very thankful for anybody that was a part of that and and helping that group be be a part of um, you know something where we were able to make a lot of lasting memories. Um, you know some some of those guys are you know still friends to, of mine to this day. So um, you know those are those are special times for me. Um. We've talked about this, and I you referenced it actually in your comments, uh, Coach Saunders. But uh, the when you were appointed the head coach, and you got a lot of questions, obviously about your dad. I, I thought your the way you're approaching that is really healthy in terms of being your own person. Mm -hmm. um, this person does bring up your dad, though, and he says he or she actually, I guess, mm -hmm. I graduated from the U in 1974 and I watched your dad play for the U of M. I will never forget the enthusiasm in that arena as the team did a choreographed warm up mm -hmm. that was a hallmark of their team. Um, and the question is, can you tell me what one of the most important faith lessons your father taught you was? Yeah, uh, I think my father just he he, he really just showed me that faith can look like a, it can look like a number of different things to, to, you know, whoever's, um, to a number of different people. And he did that by, uh, you know, just explaining to me that, you know, the way you live and the way you treat people, um, you know, sometimes, it, and this, and Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm just speaking from my experience. Um, uh, but the way, the way you live as a Christian and the way you treat people as a Christian, um, can be more important than if you know, you know, every book of the Bible. Um, and, and that it's, it's more of, you know, living out the Christian life as opposed to, um, you know, just being somebody who, you know, has met, has done a great job of memorizing how, it sh how you should live out your life. Okay. Um, I love this one. Where did you get your training to become an NBA coach and what type of credentials do you need to become a head coach? Oh, <laughs> uh, Hey, you get your, uh, your training through experience, um, you know, experience and credentials to become a head coach. I mean, I think it's, you know, I, I've had a lot of great opportunities and, um, you know, it's, it's been, you know, I spent a, over 10 years as an assistant in the NBA, um, you know, learned a lot. I give a lot of people credit that I work for, um, you know, and then, you know, any success I've ever had is, you know, really for the most part, uh, because of other people. Um, so, you know, I, I say just being around people that, uh, also, you know, help you, help you bloom and help you grow, um, is very important. Um, okay. I'm going to put you on the spot here a little bit and you'll be able to deflect this however you want. But the question is simply who's better, Michael Jordan or LeBron James? You know, they're, they're both tough. They're, uh, you know, they, they both played in, in different eras and, and, uh, you know, I think it's a different game at times, you know, there's, you know, I never had an opportunity to prepare for Michael Jordan as a coach. Um, you know, but preparing for LeBron James is tough. It is because he can do so many different things, but I was able to watch Michael Jordan and, and in a way idolize what he did growing up. And, you know, I know he was, uh, very difficult to, uh, prepare for as well as a coach. So, you know, you don't want to see either one of those guys on the, on the other side. If they're, if you're on, if they're on your team, you feel, you feel better, but, uh, you know, it's, it's tough. It's tough against guys like that. Nice. Um, here's one about the city of Minneapolis. You talked, uh, you know, you're a homegrown person. You love the city. Uh, this person says Minneapolis is a great place to live, but not a cool place to play. Mm -hmm. Maybe you would argue with that like LA or Boston. How do you get a player to come here? You got, you got to try to do things to, to set yourself apart. And I think that our organization, you know, I talked about, you know, my relationship with Gerson, um, our president, and then, you know, we have a CEO in Ethan Casson. We have an owner in, uh, uh, 
Mr. Taylor, Glenn Taylor, that, you know, we share a family at, we have a family atmosphere. So I think having something like that, that can appeal to an individual, especially an individual raising a young family, um, maybe more than, than a city could. And, you know, Hey, I'm, I'm really hoping you get, we get a chance to play a little bit in the summertime or, or we have that opportunity because, you know, for people to see Minneapolis in the summertime too, um, you know, it, it's, it's really a special place. And Hey, I, I say that the winters aren't that bad either, you know, but I grew up here. Uh, you can, you can stay inside in the skyways. You know, this is my pitch. So that's what I usually say. You stay inside the skyways downtown, you know, as long as you want. Um, but Minneapolis is a special place. Uh, people just need to give it a chance. Well, in your last response, you talked about the leadership team there yourself, uh, Gerson, Ethan, uh, Mr. Taylor, uh, the question involves all of them. It says a little over a year ago, there was a complete turnover of leadership in the organization. Um, all of you have since been very focused on building a, a culture that you'd like to sustain for years to yeah. come. As a leader in establishing that culture, um, how do you balance making faith part of that cultural message when you probably have many different individuals on your yeah. team uh, that come from a variety of different yeah. faith backgrounds? Yeah, no, that's a good question. And, and, you know, I, I talked, I guess, a little bit about it. You know, our chapel service um, allows us to it allows us to um, get together with other Christians. Um, you know, we have I've had other players, um, you know, play you know for me or, or for our team um, that you know are Muslim or you know maybe maybe aren't necessarily a believer, but you always want to give you know whatever they they believe in their faith um, calls them to be. You know, I always made sure to give this individual time to pray, um, you know, and make sure he had, he was he was taken care of in that sense, um, you know, w within the Muslim faith. Uh, so, you know, you want to make it a part of uh, your organization. Um, you want to do it respectfully, too. But I think a lot of it is based off of principles, too, and how, how you lead your life. And, you know, we did have a complete shift in leadership, um, you know, and, and we've had some really good people come through and be, be leaders in our organization too. Um, you know, but you know, as, as Gerson, myself, um, and then Ethan have, have talked more, you know, we were kind of, that's something that, that will bond us, can bond us together too. So I think you find like anything in life, you find common, uh, bonds and you run with them cause you believe in those. Um, okay. So I, again, I, I'm grateful for all these questions coming in. I am, uh, I don't know enough about basketball. I apologize to know if this is a loaded question or not. So I'm simply going to pass it on. Uh, what kind of relationship? I'll deflect it if I don't like it. Okay, fair enough. That's totally fine. Uh, the question is, what kind of relationship do you have with Devin Booker? He plays for another team. Next question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there's a there's a lot of rules in the NBA. You're Got not it. allowed to comment on other players. So okay, fair enough. <laughs> um, uh, this one's about becoming a father. Congratulations on becoming a father this past year. How has being a father changed your perspective, how you lead a group of young men in basketball, and also how has it impacted how you think about and lead in faith? Yeah. Um, no, that's a, that's a good topic, topic to broach. I mean, it's, you know, having a son has been, uh, you know, the greatest thrill of my life. It, it really has. And being able to um, be with him and Haley over these last, you know, nine weeks, I believe, I think, I think that's kind of where we are, um, give or take, uh, days kind of blend together, but, um, <laughs> being able to be with him, him and Haley, these last, uh, you know, nine weeks has been, um, something that, you know, I've enjoyed. Um, obviously I miss the competing. I miss, you know, being with, with the team, being with the players, but seeing him grow and seeing him, you know, be able to do different things and actually like, being able to see something, a different, a change in him every day, um, is, is something that's really special. And, you know, looking at him, you, you want to be a better man and you want to um, succeed more, uh, cause you want to, you know, you want to do right by him. Uh, but you also want to make sure that he, he grows up in, in a household, um, where faith is a priority and, uh, you know, he, he will. So it's, uh, it's, it's been cool to, it's unbelievable to be a father. Yeah. And congratulations again on that. Um, uh, this one's about uh, sort of figuring out how to strike the right balance between the hours at, at home and at work. Um, and in your role, particularly, I'm sure you could work 24 hours a day. Um, 
so the, the question is, can you say a word about yeah. that? And then is there someone who sort of is a role model for you mm -hmm. who you think does it well? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm still, I'm a work in progress when it comes to that. I mean, I, you know, that is one thing about this job is, is it's, it's, uh, there's always something to be done. There's always something you can do more of. There's always something you can prepare for. Um, so I think at times, and, and I'm still learning to be better with it, uh, at times, you know, shutting, shutting off a little bit, uh, is good. And, you know, that's one of the things that this quarantine has, has you know, given me an opportunity to do. And, uh, you know, I, I've, I think that when people talk about, you know, being a professional basketball coach, um, you you might just think it's, Hey, it's just basketball. You show up for the games and you're, you know, you roll the balls out there and, and you, and you coach. Um, but there's a lot of, a lot of things that, that go into that. Uh, so striking the balance is important. And I, yeah, I learned how, how many things really go, how many decisions are made. Um, you know, last, I tell this story, but last year, uh, you know, after I took over, I had to make a decision. We're getting ready for a game and somebody needed me to check off something where, whether we wanted asparagus or broccoli on the plane. And so decisions can go all the way. I, I figured out a way to pass that to somebody else now, but, <laughs> but, uh, I didn't know that at first, you know, and uh, what did you pick by the way? Uh, I picked a little bit of both, <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, and, and I think that, you know, my wife does a good job of, of, uh, you know, helping me be present. Um, you know, we have our things that we, we like to do. We like our walks. Um, you know, we like our, our shows, uh, you know, whatever it is, you know, we, we have our things. Okay. Um, this takes you back to the, the time you spent as an assistant with the wizards. Who were some of the all-star players you coached with the wizards and what mm -hmm. impact do you think you had on those players? Um, I mean, I, I, I mean, when I say this is that, you know, any impact that was had on, on the player was because of the player. I mean, it's, you know, I, I was just there to, there to help in any way possible, but, you know, I had the privilege of working with John wall and working with Bradley Beal. Um, those guys were, uh, and still are special players and special individuals. Um, you know, and, and uh, you know, some, we, we, I've been able to have talks of faith with them in the past too. So it's good to see, you know, guys like that in, in chapel before games now, you know, even as I'm, you know, 10 years later, I'm a head coach and, you know, I get to see them. Uh, and so I'm, I'm happy that they're still being still able to, uh, to be in Washington. Cause that's, that's a great organization. Um, but also, you know, guys who are young fathers as well. So it, it's cool to share that. Um, couple of fun ones and we're wrapping it up here pretty quickly, but, um, <laughs> this one is who wins a game of around the world or horse you or KG. KG. <laughs> I mean, I, hey, you I, and I think I could have answered that. One. I mean, I'm a, you know, I'm a confident, I'm a confident guy, but I'm a self-aware individual as well. <laughs> um, if you weren't involved in basketball coaching or sports in general, uh, do you have a sense of what other career path you think you might have chosen or what you'd be doing? You know what? My mom actually said that, you know, I would maybe, maybe I might have your job, Pastor Westmeyer. Oh, right. She, she always thought that, that I would, would have been, um, gone, uh, the pastoral oh. route. Oh. So, hmm. um, Interesting. but I mean, it, it, so, something that I could, I could try to help others or have an mm -hmm. impact. You know, I'm, I'm a people person. I like being around people, being around um, youth and helping, trying to help. Well, and I have no doubt you are, in fact, making an impact in pastoral ways in your role. I mean, uh, no question about that. Um, related to that, outside of basketball, what kinds of things are you passionate about? You've talked about some of those uh, walks with your wife and being yeah. a dad, but are there other things you're passionate about? Um, I mean, really, it's just... Right now, it's anything that involves family. Mm. Um, you know, that's, that's, you know, basketball, basketball, my faith and family. I mean, that's, that's pretty much all I, I live by. And then, you know, when, uh, when my wife goes to bed and, and Lucas goes to bed, you know, late at night, I'll, I'll uh, turn on something on Netflix or I'll watch my game film. But usually, you know, during quarantine, you turn on something on net Netflix, um, you know, so that's kind of what I do do right now outside of it. But a lot of a lot of what I do is, is just trying to, um, 
get better. I'm, I'm very focused on just trying to get better. All right. A couple final questions here. The, this one just came in. Uh, what kind of work for charity do you do? Do you want to say a, a word about, so I know you do a number of things in town. Uh, you want to yeah. say some of that, what some of those are? Yeah. I mean, uh, Haley and I have been involved in, in a number of different initiatives. Uh, but I guess one, you know, as long as I have time, I, you know, focus on is, um, you know, Carl Anthony Towns is a special person. He's a, he's a man of faith as well. Um, he's, he's somebody who, you know, has endured a lot, uh, during this COVID crisis. Um, but you know, he's, he's also given a lot and, you know, being able to, uh, him, him being able to, to join with Mayo and, uh, you know, start, start a fund in his mother's name there to help with the research when it comes to COVID, um, is something, you know, that I, I definitely would, uh, would like to share with anybody out there because, you know, anything does, does matter. And, and she was a, a very special individual who made everybody feel so, um, so important every time she saw you. So, uh, you know, she just sp spread joy. Um, and they're, they've been a faithful family. Um, but you know, so if, if anybody's, you know, that all that money goes to good use. Uh, but, you know, Haley and I are, are, are involved in a number of different initiatives, um, you know, where we've done some things with big brothers, big sisters. Um, we've done a number of different things with uh, whether it be, you know, working with, with hospitals, um, you know, during this crisis. But, um, you know, we, I also have, have always wanted to make sure that, that kids are able to attend games, um, you know, when they, when they maybe aren't, as for, aren't fortunate enough to, you know, be afforded those tickets. So we, we figured out a way with the Timberwolves fast break foundation to donate tickets to every game this year. Um, so a number of different initiatives. All right. Final question. This, uh, I'm going to give credit to one of my uh, pastoral colleagues here, uh, pastor Mark Schmid, who in turn was borrowing it from James Lipton, who, and now I'm spacing on his, uh, the thing he did, but, um, his, the question is, uh, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates, which by the way, I hope isn't anytime soon. Oh man. Well, well done. That's, right. that's a great question. That's a great way to end it. Yeah. Well, and again, I want to thank you. I thanks. Thanks to everyone for joining us tonight. Um, uh, I'm grateful to have you here. I will say that, you know, obviously during this time of pandemic, uh, we're not entirely sure what's going to happen in the next few months. We do have next year's season scheduled. It's interesting that we would talk a little bit about the Chicago Bulls because our first speaker in the fall, uh, and mark your calendars, is Thursday, October 1st. We'll feature um, another famous Chicago athlete, Mike Singletary, uh, who is a linebacker for the Chicago Bears. Um, so uh, we'll see if he can actually be in in person here uh, at St. Philip Deacon, or if we have to do it virtually again, but again, October 1st in the, the fall. Um, so thanks everyone for joining us. And, and coach Saunders, I, I, I would give this to you in person, but <laughs> I'm not next to you. So I'm going to have to send this to you. Sounds we, good. we give each of our speakers a granite plaque that, that says with thanks uh, in, in this case, uh, with thanks to Ryan Saunders for bringing faith to life. And we want to thank you so much for taking a few minutes. I know you're incredibly busy. Absolutely. Uh, so thanks for your words. Thanks for your time. And uh, thanks everyone for joining us. And we will see you again in the fall.